Hello and uh, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Philip Hoddell and I'm the chairman here at Birkin Long. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this Wednesday webinar. Birkin Long have been offering fortnightly webinars on a range of different legal subjects. After today, we're going to take a short break for the summer. And when we return in September, we'll look at tax and estate planning across the generations. So if you're interested in that or any of our other webinars, please sign up at www.birkitlong.co.uk forward slash events. Today's webinar is being presented by Jackie McKirk, a solicitor in the Birkit Long Dispute Resolution Team. An expert in all types of property litigation, Jackie is going to be looking at commercial rent arrears and how to recover them. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to her. Thank you very much, Philip. As Philip has said, I am a solicitor here at um, Burkitt Long. I work within dispute resolution and I have a keen focus on property litigation. Just to let you know that we will be taking questions at the end, so please do make use of the Q&A facility if you do have any questions throughout this. Um, whilst working within our dispute resolution team here, I've obviously been dealing with the property aspects and throughout my career, we all know, enforcing non-payment of rent is pretty standard in terms of commercial landlord and tenant. That is until the arrival of the pandemic and with it obviously the onslaught of new legislation and rules that came in to protect tenants' rights and interests. The dust has settled and it's now what we would say is a good time for us to be able to consider what laws remain in place, what options commercial landlords have to recover rent arrears and what enforcement action is appropriate. Some of you may well be familiar with these options and this may well just be a refresher and to others of you it may be all new. So do contact me at the end if you want to discuss anything. What I would say and to caveat is that each lease will have its own clauses. Um, it will always depend on the clause of that lease and any documents to what steps a landlord can take if a tenant's in breach. So I'll only be outlining the general provisions here and broad options as to what we can do in terms of rent arrears. The way I've thought about going through this is I'm going to go through a number of scenarios, how different enforcement action may apply to each scenario, because really practically, the way in which we can apply enforcement action will depend on the needs of the landlord and tenant in that particular situation. Each situation will be unique, each party will have different objectives and there isn't really a one tick box that fits all. So without um, further ado, I'll go through to scenario A. If we can go on to the next slide, thank you. Oh, so yeah, if we are to confirm as well that this all this information is just for um, the purposes of this webinar and it doesn't constitute legal advice um, and everything is correct up to the 13th of July being today but it's all subject to change and as I say said just before all subject to each particular lease and what will be set out um, in the terms of those documents as to how you can affect the enforcement of any rent arrears. So if we go into scenario A this is what I like to think of as the one-off incident. The way I've put it is that we have a tenant, they've been in occupation for five years, good relationship with the landlord, lease is due to run for 15 more years, therefore they're going to be in occupation for quite some time. Tenants approached landlord and said, look, I've got a key piece of machinery, it needs to be repaired, we weren't expecting this to happen, we've not anticipated for it and we don't have the cash flow, can you give me a month off? Um, if you allow me to do this, it will stop the um, halt of production and I'll be able to, to commence trading again and I'll be able to get the funds in place for the next quarter. Another thing to consider is that the landlord doesn't want to remarket as knows, um, as they know that their area is slow for lettings to tenants. Payment date for that quarter comes and goes. Tenants not paid, made payment, but it's confirmed they'll still be able to make payment for the next quarter because they've used the funds to be able to replace the machinery. In this scenario, landlord may not want to go for the nuclear option. They don't, might not want to bring the lease to an end. Um, instead, they're thinking, why not be a bit more commercial here and pragmatic? What other approaches are there? Something else that may be able to be used to preserve that landlord and tenant relationship, particularly where the lease is meant to be ongoing for a good 15 years. If we look at 
option A, really this is going to then be, if we could just pop the next slide on please. Thank you. So yeah, if we look at option A, this is going to be a payment agreement. It's really going to be the uh, most informal method in which you can seek to recover um, commercial arrears. A landlord can enter into a payment agreement with the tenant for the particular quarter's rent for a payment in agreed instalments. Any agreement will need to be worded so carefully. This is to ensure that if the tenant were to default on that payment, that the landlord is protected so that they can enforce the default as though the rent was unpaid under the lease. This then preserves their forfeiture rights and any other rights are, um, are vested within that lease. In addition, the agreement will need to clearly distinguish between the ring fenced arrears of that quarter and the ongoing rent payments due under the lease so that the tenant cannot try and argue at a later date that the now monthly payment is in relation to ongoing future quarter days as well. This is key. Um, the landlord does not want to be in a position where the tenant says future rent is paid under the same instalment plans um, or that they're um, on a default they can't then recover um, sums due. The advantages of going down a route such as a, a payment plan are that it preserves that landlord and tenant relationship which can be quite key if they've been working together for five years now they want, they want to preserve it but it's a one-off incident. It allows the tenant that chance to continue trading and not fall into further arrears and it can relieve that financial pressure off of the tenant. The risks of this route however are that if it's not properly drafted a landlord could be left in a position where payment of those arrears cannot be enforced properly uh, if the tenant were to default and it could compromise the ability to pursue the arrears at a later perhaps inevitable date. Even though I say that for this isolated incident, it may be that the landlord prefers not to incur the time and costs of other methods. Looking now at the second option, that is draw down on a rent deposit. Not all leases have a rent deposit in place, so this will again depend on the circumstances of this particular lease. If there is a rent deposit in place, then a term of that rent deposit is typically that a landlord uh, can draw down in the event of a breach, a breach usually being that rent has gone unpaid. Always please be mindful <laughs> that there may well be notice requirements within that rent deposit, meaning that a landlord has to notify a tenant if they're going to make a drawdown of funds. What you don't want to do is be in breach as a landlord for the tenant's breach because you've then failed to notify the tenant that you're going to be drawing down on the funds. So always ensure that you read the terms of that deed carefully as to what notice requirements are necessary in this situation. Where this is an isolated incident, as it is within our scenario, use of the rent deposit it can maintain again that um, relationship between the parties and it provides that and provided the tenant can top up in accordance with the terms, it allows for a swift conclusion. Do be mindful though that if a tenant is unable to top up in accordance with the requirements of the deed, they then could be in, um, in breach of the terms, putting further pressure on the tenant to raise funds. So it's one of those going to be a balancing act between how long the tenant needs to be able to raise the funds in order to be able to top up that rent deposit to the necessary funds and limits. Please note that um, a drawdown is likely to waive the right to forfeit. I'll come on to forfeiture a bit later on, um, but it's important to note that taking this course of action is likely to waive that right to be able to forfeit the lease and therefore any landlord needs to consider um, whether they do think this is going to be a one-off incident and forfeiture is unlikely or whether actually forfeiture should be undertaken in order to preserve the landlord's interests or the um, uh, any other enforcement action they want to take. What I would say, and it's something to keep in mind throughout this, is that it's always going to be a balancing act and it's one way really transparency from the tenant could make the difference between what options are then enforced by a landlord um, in terms of recovery and arrears. So it's always better for a, a tenant to try and be truthful. Equally, um, it's a commercial decision for a landlord to make. Do they believe the fact that the tenant's only going to miss this one quarter or actually is it more likely that the they're going to this is going to be a repeat occurrence and actually they don't want to waive any ability they have for other means. I'd say it's um, crucial that if they're minded to forfeit you take no steps which would lose the land with this right. So if we go on to option C 
this is court proceedings for recovery of arrears. If we remember back to our scenario that we have, our scenario is based on one quarter's rent going unpaid during a time when there's no laws preventing that tenant making payment. Although court proceedings, they sound as though they're going to be serious, they can actually be used as a tool by both parties to secure that payment whilst allowing the tenant a period of time to commence trading again. I say this because um, some of you may be aware, um, having been through the pre process before, that traditional debt proceedings are quite protracted. It can take many months to reach a hearing, and even then a court order is simply a piece of paper confirming a judgment debt. What then will have to happen is a landlord will have to consider methods of enforcing that judgment debt. It means that um, during this time, the tenant may be able to regain its financial control and make payment during the course of the court matter or shortly thereafter. Um, I say this because in our scenario, they only wanted one month off um, or one um, quarter off rather, and it could take far longer than that to reach the conclusion of a court case. This means for the it again preserves the landlord and tenant relationship, allows it to continue while securing the position of recovery of arrears. The risk, I would say, is that court proceedings can be costly, and this is both in time and in money. Um, it's also been mindful as to um, a limit typically applied in court proceedings is a recovery of rent arrears going back six years. Usually a landlord wouldn't allow arrears to accrue for that period of time. But I think as we'll all appreciate, the years kind of have slipped away from us, uh, particularly for the for, since 2020. So it's always useful to keep in mind a schedule of those arrears. What I would say is the three options I've just gone through being um, informal, like a, a payment plan that's set up between the parties directly, um, court proceedings for recovery and drawdown on a rent deposit. These are routes that work to maintain an, an ongoing relationship between landlord and tenant while securing payment of outstanding sums. These will not suit every need. However, in the scenario we had, I, I would suggest that these options would be the most favourable in the circumstances. If I then go to the second scenario, this is probably um, more key and crucial for the, where we find ourselves today. And I'd call, I've called this the elusive tenant. In this scenario, we have a company, Coy Limited, and they took up occupation in January 2020, and they have a five-year lease. Coy Limited initially paid rent well, however, during the pandemic, they failed to pay rent for a period of six months. It's worth noting that Coy Limited is a seafood restaurant. Since the moratorium is lifted, Coy Limited has been paying rent, however, the landlord has not been able to make contact about the arrears, and Coy Limited has made no proposal for the same. In this situation, perhaps more formal steps are required than those three that we've already visited because parties need to be mindful about the time of arrears and interplay with enforcement and try and see it really get um, engagement where there is an elusive party. If we look at option A, this is the Commercial Rent Coronavirus Act 2022. The reason I've put this first is that the scenario that I presented raises very different considerations to those that we visited in the first scenario. Notably, Coy Limited, being a seafood restaurant, would have been subject to forced closures as a result of the government imposed lockdowns, provided that is that it was a dining restaurant rather than takeaway facility only. Even if the company was able to trade by way of a takeaway service, if its primary function was at a restaurant, and it wholly or partly had to close that part of that premises, it will be subject to this new act. A key um, consideration is that the act applies to periods of forced closure. Periods of forced closure relevant to this commence at 2 p.m. on the 21st of March 2020 and end on or before 11.55 p.m. on the 18th of July 2021, and that is for business tenancies in England or 6 a.m. 7th of August 2021, and that's for business tenancies in Wales. It is irrelevant for the purposes of this Act whether a business chose to close during periods outside of those that I've mentioned. It is only periods of forced closure that gain protection from the Act. This is a very important distinction, as we know that there are a lot of businesses that, that felt they were forced to close because of certain reduced trading hours in operation or restrictions 
for instance, on eating out or drinking, um, uh, well, I say eating out and drinking inside a premises. However, it's only those dates that I've mentioned that are relevant to this procedure. With this in mind, the landlord will need to consider what periods out of those six months in my scenario fall into the periods of false closure and are therefore ring fenced. This is because out of the six months, we'll be able to work out that not all of that period will fall within the protected regime. When we look at the act and the process, if we can just pop back, I'm still just, I've, I'm going to have a bit to say on this one just because it's new legislation. Um, so if we look at the act and the process, the legislation only came into force on the 24th of March 2022. It's very new and, and very fresh. Um, there's what I would say is a long stop date that everyone needs to be aware of. This is six months from the date in which um, the, the legislation came into play that either the landlord or tenant can apply to have those ring fence arrears subject to the arbitration. So that's a six month period in which you can uh, seek to go down this route. There is the option that Secretary of State may extend this legislation, but of course we cannot guarantee the same. So how it works is that an arbitrator will be appointed by um, either party. They, the arbitrator can then make a reward, um, what an award, that award can either be a reduction of the protected rent, and all the time to pay it and they can allow a tenant up to 24 months to repay those ring fenced arrears. Um, it's expected that the arbitration is meant to be more of a backstop for the parties should instead intend to negotiate um, themselves independently of this regime. What this means is that whilst tenants were protected during the worst of the pandemic and had a period where the rent could go unpaid and the landlord really had no recourse, Two years on, the measures have been put in place to actually level this playing field and say, hold on a moment, we're going to put this long stop date in. Someone will then consider these arrears if a party challenges them. Where a tenant has periods of false closure, um, there's just no longer that blanket protection. Each case will turn on its own facts, though, and that includes the level of the arrears, how much the arrears impact a business for, on both sides. Um, so, for instance, if repayment of those arrears will result in a tenant company being made insolvent, this will be taken into account by an arbitrator. Similarly, though, if a landlord um, is also going to be financially impacted by any award that could be made and its own solvency is called into question, this again will be um, assessed by an arbitrator, including the assets and liabilities of the parties and in any other financial information that may be relevant. Each party prepares a statement and a proposal to the arbitrator, and this will then form um, uh, the referral that goes to an approved body, and an approved list will be kept available all times the public can see. In terms of fees of the of arbitration, at this point it's not entirely clear. We haven't had um, enough test cases to see what those overall fees will be, but um, what I would say is that the referring party initially pays the fees for the arbitration. If the arbitration is completed on the papers and an award is made, then the arbitrator can then make an award that the other party is to pay 50% back to the referring party. Equally, an arbitrator may assess that that proportion should change from 50% and it may go all the way down to 0%. During the, part, um, the process, either party can then as, um, request that rather than be heard on the papers, that there's an oral hearing. Whichever party requests the oral hearing, will then pay for those fees of the um, of the hearing itself. Again, it doesn't have to be the referring party that pays. It may be the other party that requests an oral hearing. Again, after the decision and award is made, an arbitrator can ask the other party to contribute towards the fees. So the actual costs will be dependent on the arbitrator appointed, the complexity and the value of the dispute, time taken and whether a hearing is required. For instance, a barrister's sliding scale may be from £250 per hour to £500 and therefore fees can be vastly different depending on the outlook. If I then actually look at the outlook of the Act, I'd say at the moment it's still just to be determined as to whether the binding arbitration scheme will be worthwhile. Personally, I consider that it's going to be the fallback position for the parties. That is because ultimately if the arbitrator is really only going to be able to make an award as to repayment amounts and a payment plan, do the parties want to incur those fees of having a payment plan put in place when they may be able to negotiate it themselves directly? 
So it's one to consider there. Um, I'd say as well, if we just reconsider our scenario, it was only six months worth of arrears or two quarters. And to that extent, even if out of that four months arrears are ring fenced, the parties will have to consider the value of the arrears and whether arbitration, particularly the cost of it, are worthwhile compared to reaching a negotiated settlement. I suspect that both landlord and tenant will have reservations, um, not only due to potential costs of paying the arbitrator, but also timeframes. There are timeframes in which the parties have to comply um, and the arbitrator is meant to make their award as soon as practicable. However, that can be extended. If it's unduly complex, then uh, the arbitrator can delay the time in which the award is made. Again, after an oral hearing, the award is meant to be made within 14 days. However, again, that can be extended too. So it does leave it slightly open ended as to the time frame in which the parties could expect an award under this act where they could instead potentially look to um, reach a negotiated settlement far sooner. If I then just go on to the next option available to the parties, which is statutory demand. So this is where once the landlord's calculated the arrears which fall within the um, forced closure period and those which are not protected, those that are not protected are then um, capable of being enforced as any arrears um, were before or after the Act. So the methods of enforcing payment are much the same as scenario one. So they can look to draw down from a, an available rent deposit, they can reach an agreed payment plan with the party and or they can commence debt recovery court proceedings. But in addition to those options, in this scenario where the tenant has been elusive and the landlord has not been able to make contact with them, um, the landlord may think actually I want to take firmer steps in order to protect its position and to bring about engagement from the uh, the tenant. The landlord may then serve a statutory demand on the tenant where there's no dispute to the amount owing. That is crucial because you cannot serve a statutory demand um, statutory demand where there is a dispute. It, that's an abusive process and the tenant would be able to make an application to have that demand struck out and the landlord could face costs. So it's key there that it has to be undisputed sums. Um, a demand can be served where there are arrears of £750 or more for a company tenant or 5,000 or more for a tenant who is an individual. A demand requires the tenant to pay within 21 days of service. Otherwise, it's then open for the landlord to commence bankruptcy or winding up proceedings. So what we're really thinking is that the advantage is that the demand will prompt a tenant into prioritising the payment of the arrears over their other outgoings because they know that there's that risk of the insolvency proceedings on the doorstep if they don't make prompt payment. Um, a risk that the landlord faces um, it could be that it really will may well impact that ongoing landlord and tenant relationship. However, you've got have to think the tenant's been elusive. Is there really a relationship to maintain in this instance? Also, if a landlord does indeed follow through winding up or bankruptcy proceedings and such an outcome is achieved of the bankruptcy, then payment of secured creditors, it takes priority and then no guarantee as to repayment of the arrears in full or at all for the landlord. It will be for the landlord to consider the viability of the tenant and whether actually allowing that tenant to trade may be the more commercially attractive option where rents are unpaid if they're going to be left with a unit that's empty, if for any reason they ended up um, seeking the, the bankruptcy or winding up of that tenant. It's also worth noting that due to certain restrictions on recovery under the insolvency regime, if it's the case that a solvent tenant would have survived if given the time to trade, then landlord's ability to recover the debts is capable of being reduced. That's really important consideration to make there. So you don't want to be serving a statutory demand and following through with the um, proceedings if that is not a reasonable approach to be taken. If we then look at option C, this is looking at commercial rent arrears recovery. Now this scheme has been around for some time now, have, however during um, the pandemic, it was heavily curtailed. Now that the moratoriums have, have lifted, option is open again, and this uh, option is a form of enforcing rent arrears, but it's only those arrears again that fall outside of the ring fence protected period. Um, so those 
uh, ring fenced arrears are still subject to arbitration. And this scheme, the commercial rent arrears of recovery, can only be used for those arrears that fall outside of that protected time frame. What this scheme does is that it allows a landlord to instruct an enforcement agent to take control of a tenant's goods and sell them in order to recover an equivalent value to the rent arrears. It, there are certain um, and various notices that need to be served on tenant by an enforcement agent at each stage of a process. The form of the notices are not prescribed, which means there's not a standard form that has to be used. However, there is certain information that must be included within the forms for them to be binding. So therefore, make sure that you're up to date with this and have this ensure that everything's included. The procedure can only be used for written leases, not verbal, and it can be only be used during the term of the lease. It also only applies to purely commercial units. So if a part of the unit is let out as a residential dwelling, the scheme cannot be used. It also also only applies to pure rent. This means that if the rent within the lease includes maintenance or service charges, for instance, then what the landlord will have to do is apportion that uh, uh, sum to work out what the true rent is. And it's on a net basis that you're looking for. And then that figure will be the figure of arrears that's then pursued. The right to um, recover goods must be exercised within 12 months of notice having been given to the tenant. The enforcement agent can then take goods or enter into a controlled goods agreement with the tenant. There are certain exemptions that apply. Um, for instance, if there's com computer equipment or say, and that computer equipment is needed for the business operation of the tenant and its value is less than, I believe, uh, 1,350, you can then, you can't seize those goods. Anything above that threshold though, you can recover and you can seize. After um, a period of time, seven days after the seizure of goods, the goods can then be sold. This is again provided that certain formalities have been complied with. There are formalities in terms of providing valuations and allowing the, um, the time frame to lapse. Of course, if payment is received in that period of time before um, the sale of goods, then the sale should not proceed and the goods and an agreement should be reached with the tenant as to being able to allow them to recover the goods. Goods should be sold for the best price that can be obtained. What that best price is, it's partly subjective, but also objective in the sense that if valuation evidence has been provided, the landlord should always have regard to that valuation evidence. The route can be useful. It can be useful where you have an elusive tenant. As if you can imagine, if a tenant is avoiding the landlord, however, they then receive a notice to say that their goods may be seized, well, then it may well bring them to the table to make payment or to at least negotiate on payment. It's particularly useful if the arrears are not significant and it's likely that the tenant could have goods to the value to clear the sums. I'd say that it's not so useful if the, the arrears are significant. We have arrears, say, of £40,000, but we think there may only be goods to value of £5,000 in the premises. Then it may not be proportionate or appropriate for be going down this route and there may be better and more suitable alternatives that would gain um, a higher value that's um, towards the sums outstanding to the landlord. Do remember that this route going down it would prevent forfeiture. Forfeiture may be more useful if the arrears are significant. In our present scenario, much of the uh, arrears were ring fenced. I've said about four months out of the six looked to be ring fenced arrears and if it's only a limited sum that's looking to be enforced then this may be a route that's suitable Again, you'd have to discuss the objectives with the landlord at all times to consider what the key um, is for them to achieve. If we look at the final scenario that I've put together, this is the significant arrears tenant. In this scenario, we have a tenant. They've been in occupation for five years. They've not paid their rent for the last four quarters and absolutely no explanation as to why. The tenant was assigned the remaining 10 year term from the original tenant who entered into an authorised guarantee agreement prior to the assignment. The landlord knows the area is a good place to market to new tenants and the landlord is a large organisation with the priority being to regain the property to prevent any further arrears occurring and to allow a relet. Option A, forfeiture. I have mentioned the word forfeiture a couple of times in brief when going through the other options available to landlords. 
there had been a freeze on the ability for landlords to forfeit leases for non-payment of rent. However, that stay has lifted. Forfeiture means the bringing of a lease to an end due to a breach. It simply puts, there has to be a clause within the lease that permits forfeiture. The key consideration here is that forfeiting a lease will secure the landlord back the premises, but it will not secure payment of arrears. In our scenario, we had a landlord who was confident of being able to relet the premises and their key consideration was securing the unit. However, in the current climate, there may well be landlords in areas that will struggle to relet and they need to consider the chances have, of having a unit left empty versus pursuing alternative means of enforcement. If a landlord is more concerned about the recovery of money, OM, then it may want to use another means of enforcement alongside forfeiture and we'll have to consider um, the most cost effective means of that. For rent arrears alone, um, if we were to go down the pure forfeiture route, if, rent, if it's only rent arrears, no notice needed to be served on the tenant in advance of, in advance of the forfeiture. That is provided that it is a um, pure commercial unit. Do be mindful that if it's a mixed use unit, so there is a residential, then um, or you're also pursu you're pursuing breaches other than non-payment of rent, then you have to serve notice on the tenant. And in certain circumstances, you have to seek an order from the court before you can then go on in to forfeit. I've mentioned previously that certain for um, enforcement methods could prevent the use of forfeiture, uh, such as commercial rent arrears recovery action. This is called waiver. So where a landlord waives the right to be able to use forfeiture, it has to wait until the next uh, breach in order to be able to rely on using forfeiture. Um, this is, for instance, if you have rent that is due on the 25th of December, if it's demanded in advance of the 25th of December, the landlord has not waived the right to be able to rely on that um, quarter going unpaid and it can enforce against it. If, however, the landlord, uh, 25th of December comes and goes, no payment is made and the landlord doesn't immediately forfeit and elects to treat the lease as continuing and then accepts rent under for the 25th of December late or they demand the rent late, then this is treated as waiving. So you've treated the lease as continuing and therefore after the breach has occurred and you're then not entitled to rely on that breach um, going forward and you have to wait until the next quarter goes unpaid to be able to enforce against the tenant for non-payment of rent. This is really important. Some parties don't always realise that they have waived the right to be able to forfeit. And it's very, very, um, uh, it's, it's crucial that parties are aware of this because sometimes the best approach for a landlord that wishes to protect its rights is just to simply cease all communications with the tenant and it avoids the argument completely as to whether the right to forfeit has been waived. If the right has been waived, and the tenant seeks relief for a uh, wrongful forfeiture, the landlord could be on the hook for legal fees. In our scenario that um, I provided, um, it's important to also bear in mind that there's four quarters have gone unpaid. That means it will be June 2021 included within that period. And that will be a part of the protected ring fenced arrears that cannot be um, enforced against by way of forfeiture and have to be ring fenced for arbitration. So it's important that the landlord considers whether the uh, tenant was forced to close, um, if the uh, arrears are ring fenced and only um, seeks to uh, forfeit in connection with arrears that are not protected. The process of forfeiture, as touched upon, is um, dependent upon whether the property is solely commercial or whether it is mixed use residential. If mixed use, then certain notices must be served. Um, one is called section, it's section 146 notice. Um, served on the tenant allows them an opportunity to remedy that breach. If it's plainly commercial, then no notice is required. Um, that is, though, unless the tenant is insolvent, in which case permission from the court may be needed. Is peacefully re-entering a commercial unit, uh, ensure there are arrears of 21 days and that the right exists within the lease. You should ensure that the locks to the premises are changed and that notices are then prominently displayed outside confirming that the lease has been forfeit. If applying to the court, it is on service of the court proceedings that the lease will be forfeit. What um, a key consideration for the landlord is, is that they must bear in mind 
that tenant can seek what is known as relief from forfeiture to have the lease reinstated as though the forfeiture did not happen after forfeiture takes place. It is crucial that the parties are aware that only the court can grant relief from forfeiture. So a landlord should be mindful that um, if they reach an agreement, they forfeit the lease, the locks have changed, the tenant comes to them and says, I'll make payment to you, please let me back into the premises, I need to trade. The tenant myself I've got ongoing contracts I need to um, perform, please let me back in. Um, what I would say is that if, if the landlord allows the tenant back in, or not, even if it's by agreement, they will have created a new tenancy as it's only the court that can uh, reinstate the existing lease. The risk here is that if a new lease has been created, the terms may not be the same as the previous terms. For instance, if that existing lease, the old one, had been contracted out of the Landlord and Tenant 1954 Act, that meant that the tenant was not protected. This new lease may not have those same, um, uh, may not have the same restrictions in place and the landlord could end up with a protected tenant in place. You want to avoid all of that. What needs to happen is an application needs to be made to court for relief from forfeiture. Then what that will happen then, if it's successful, the existing lease will be reinstated. A tenant typically to um, achieve relief from forfeiture has to pay the arrears, interest and legal fees of the landlord to be allowed um, relief. Where this happens, um, Another consideration is that a landlord really needs to be mindful about if they've already relet the unit too soon and the tenant makes an application for relief from forfeiture. So what a landlord also needs to consider is that they've not acted unreasonably quickly in granting a new tenancy um, to a third party and that any incoming tenant is aware of the risk of an application for relief from forfeiture. Very important. A tenant will also have to make an appli uh, application for relief promptly um, so as uh, if it wants to protect and ensure that it'll be able to go back in even where a third party lease has been granted. I'd say from this, what you should take away is that forfeiture is a key legal remedy. However, it can be quite complex. You must ensure the rights to proceed with forfeiture um, is in place and there has not been any waiver. And there really are some key considerations to be had by the landlord and by the tenant um, to avoid either party having to pay the other side's fees if they've made a wrongful application in relation to forfeiture. The other option, um, another option for the parties is to enforce against a guarantor. This is quite a nice um, option. Why I just was going through forfeiture, forfeiture is a nuclear option. It brings the lease to an end. It um, ends that, it completely ends that relationship of landlord and tenant. Our scenario, um, it was OK because the landlord was comfortable about being able to relet, but that may not always be the case. So what's an alternative means of pursuing a tenant who's just gone a year without paying? So as I said in our scenario, there had been a um, the tenant was an assignee. The outgoing tenant had entered into an agreement with the landlord to guarantee the uh, tenant. And as such, it allows the landlord to look to enforce against that guarantor for the principal debt. The landlord could elect to use any of the, the well, most of the uh, means that I've already discussed. For instance, they could serve a statutory demand against the guarantor for the principal sum. They could enter into a payment uh, plan with the guarantor. They could add the guarantor as a party to, to traditional debt proceedings, or they could have the guarantor top up rent deposit subject to any terms of the agreements of the agreements in place. Additionally, a landlord can serve a Section 17 notice on a guarantor. However, please do note that Section 17 notices only cover the period for the last six months worth of arrears. In our scenario, there are 12 months of arrears outstanding. So that means unless two notices have been served, the landlord may have lost the ability to pursue those sums subject to um, this notice and any underlying agreement. So if the guarantor pays in accordance with the Section 17 notice, then what the uh, guarantor could do is say to the landlord, I want to have an override in lease. The landlord then can make the decision whether it wants the guarantor to be the, the key tenant. The route is useful in terms of pursuing guarantors can assist and be really helpful to a landlord, particularly if the property is in an area where they may not be able to relet. It means the landlord can keep a tenant in the property who is not paying, but actually enforce against a guarantor to recover money each, each six months. So it's worthwhile, particularly if the guarantor is solvent and has access to funds. I'd say this is helpful, um, as I said, where the property is 
in an area where it's unlikely to gain a new tenant and it secures it's an, a nice way to secure funds for the landlord if we just go on then to recap as i've mentioned the methods so far that i've discussed today are payment agreements drawing down from a rent deposit deed commencing court proceedings for a traditional debt claim for ring fenced arrears that are subject to the protected period um, for forced closure then there's the arbitration scheme then there's seven statutory demands on a tenant there's the commercial rent arrears recovery which sees seizure of goods or there's forfeiting the lease which will bring the lease to an end securing the premises for uh, the landlord but not securing the arrears themselves and then there's the up other option of enforcing against a guarantor and that can either be by enforcing against them by serving notice on them to make payment it could be by serving a statutory demand on the guarantor it could be by way of adding them to debt proceedings um, or entering into a plan for them and I, what i tried to do throughout this is to show that there's different scenarios that could always happen it's real we're looking at real world and it's not simply a tick box exercise that one category will fit all of the um one option will fit all scenarios you need really need to go through speak to the landlord for or if you're the tenant speak to the tenant find out what the objectives are and what best suits their needs and then that way you'll be able to find the most suitable option always be mindful though it's case specific um, and every situation is different so really what I'd say is I hope that this has assisted in demonstrating what rules are currently in place, what arrears can be pursued and how false closure arrears are dealt with by way of the arbitration scheme and how the other arrears can be pursued by the usual means. I would say always seek legal advice before carrying out any action as you do not want to waive the right to pursue um, the sums by an alternative means at a later date should the initial action have not achieved the desired outcome. So that brings to an end what I wanted to cover. Um, I'd say there's a survey that we sent around to complete. Before we take questions, uh, we'll, we'll be sending around a recording into everyone that signed up to today's webinar tomorrow morning. We'll include a link to that, uh, which you just saw, which is to a short feedback survey. And I would really appreciate if you could complete that so we can make sure our future webinars are helpful to you. As said at the start, this is just one webinar out of a series of our Wednesday webinars. We're taking a break for summer, as mentioned by Philip, and then our next webinar, as to just confirm, is on the um, 7th of September. If you're interested in our future webinars, please do visit our website or our Eventbrite page to sign up. And now we will take any questions. Thank you, Jackie. Um, we did have um, a couple of questions submitted in advance. Um, the first one is, if a quarter's rent due in June went unpaid, is the whole quarter subject to arbitration or is it just the days of forced closure? OK, yes. Yeah, so this is one that I think which uh, most landlords were concerned about when the arbitration scheme was being implemented. So for this, the scheme is quite clear. It only applies to the days of forced closure. So what that means is that if you have your June quarter and you've got three month period, you have to then calculate the days where that um, particular tenant was forced to close. Any other um, days falling outside of those forced closure, you can pursue under the usual means. So it only so the scheme only applies to forced closure days, not periods of rent. Hope that helps. Thank you, Jackie. And um, we've had a question from Philip who asks, how long after a forfeiture slash repossession can any assets left in the property and not reclaimed become the property of the landlord? OK, so in terms of it will partly depend on notices have to be provided because what will happen in that instance is that the freeholder um, slash landlord will then become the bailey of those goods. And there's certain um, there's there's an act, the Torts and Interference of Goods Act. They will then become the um, bailey of those goods. Notice has to be um, provided to the tenant in relation to seizure and sale of those goods. If there are arrears, then you can um, look to um, sell the goods and put the profits 
I say profit because you can subtract the sale cost from it towards the um, arrears. In terms of the time frame, it will uh, depend on the note if you can find the tenant to serve the requisite notice, and it's all set out in the statute in terms of the notice requirements that are required to give to the tenant in those circumstances, subject to any differing um, clauses that may appear within the lease as to what could happen at the end of the term if goods are left on the site. Thank you, Jackie. Um, if anybody else does have any questions, put them into the Q&A because we have got a little bit of time left. Um, we had one more question um, submitted in advance, which was for taking control of goods. If my tenant has let out part residential without my consent, am I not allowed to use this route? OK, yes. So in I mentioned earlier that uh, when you're seeking to go down that route you can only use it for commercial units only so you can't use it where there's a residential dwelling if it's mixed use however there is a, um, a caveat to that to say that if the it's meant to be pure commercial and that commercial uh, if the commercial tenant has sublet residentially you can still use the Commercial Rental Risk Recovery Act and that scheme in order to be able to seize goods. And it doesn't matter if it's, they've let out on a residential um, dwelling. So if they've done it without the landlord's consent, you can still use the scheme. Um, and that's really, that was a measure that's put in place because you've got to think a lot of commercial tenants could just stick an employee in, say that they're letting it out and stop that scheme being able to be used. So it avoids the rogue tenants being able to go down that route. If they've not let out in accordance with the terms of the lease or sort of necessary consent, you can still use the commercial renter is recovery if it's mixed use, mixed use without consent. Thank you, Jackie. That's all the questions for this evening. OK, great. So I would say thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if there's any further questions you have, my contact details are on the page and I'd be more than happy to answer um, any queries that you have or just to have a discussion. If anyone's got any comments or um, on, on what I've said and would like to discuss anything, I'd, yeah, I'd be happy to go through those. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, please do contact me if you need to and have a good evening.